This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the From the Back Tees podcast, a podcast that is from the back tees. I'm your co-host, Jerry Luke, and joining me, as always, is our founder, head MH, I forgot what that acronym is, uh, in charge, Zach Pencer. Zach, how you doing today, buddy? I'm doing pretty good. How about you? I'm all right. Don't nobody worry about me. So, uh, we got some good responses uh, from our tweets about uh, off-season golf topics to discuss, because, hell, if you're looking forward to the President's Cup, that's in December, I'm told. So We got some time. So, yeah, not to create the Solheim Cup, but until the West Coast swing starts, I forget that there's PGA Tour after like like August or or what was the PGA Championship. The, to me, the PGA Championship used to wrap up the year. So yeah, it's a bit weird now with the schedule change, but we'll take it. Overall, I think what, it was pretty good. Speaking of, what did you think of the Tour Championship and the results? It blew me away with how much better it worked out than I thought. I thought you'd get a couple guys. At the top, and maybe uh, after reconsidering it, it sort of makes sense that it'll work. Because unless the guy in oh, first yeah. really runs away, you should have pretty close at the top and a bunch of guys. And you had it, it, the top two and the guy who played really well all tournament as the final three. Oh yeah, I 100% agree with you. I mean, it's I'm looking at the scores here, and just I remember from what I caught, it's just I remember I was trepidatious. We'll see how it happened. We'll see how it goes, etc., so forth, and. Uh, and we'll see if it takes time to sink in. I think because it didn't mess anything up and everyone's pretty happy with the result, it was a resounding success. I mean, like we were mentioning earlier uh, before we started the show, uh, Tiger won the Tour Championship last year, but he did not win the FedEx Cup. That's a big difference. And this year, have, with Rory winning it the way he did, having a great year like he did, just with no majors, I mean, I like to think that this is like, isn't Rory and Ricky Fowler the same age or something? I mean, it's like they're just now about to hit their 30s for golf right now. I mean, but Rory's got some more majors in him, absolutely. He's just, he's been hovered a little bit. But we will also be touching back to that, I'm sure, talking about the FedEx Cup Championship and the Tour Championship due to one of our Twitter questions from one of our staff members, actually. Uh, but we'll get to that later. Um, straight off the top, I wanted to uh, uh, say congratulations on Phil Mickelson tweeting... Uh, the account. Yeah, that was a big moment. Pretty cool to see Phil Mickelson reply to you. I'm so happy that Phil has found Twitter, but at the same time, part of me is like, well, this is like, this could turn into like OJ finding Twitter or something where it's just like, no, we don't want any of this. Like, this is too much. I mean, so far he's provided good content, but part of me is like, well, I don't know if he, he also is like tipping his hand to, to lunacy. I can't tell. <laughs> could he keep it up? He answers so many people, it seems. Or he goes on stretches of answering everyone. Well, it's usually, it's probably when he's sitting, riding in a car, or sitting at the airport, or something like that. I mean, that's, that's kind of was always the thing I liked the most about uh, Twitter was, it's the randomness. It's not if you had the best question or whatever, it's if you just happen to catch somebody at a moment. That's why usually when I get on Twitter, I will just ask questions as I think of them, because I don't know if that person is, like, happens. Because if you're a big-time celebrity or whatever, you get, like, bombarded with messages and tweets on a minutely basis. And so it's not going to... I bet they have their notifications turned off. Like, they don't have... A yeah, you have every to. Every time they pinged or whatever. That being said, um, I like to catch people, like, just, like, real quick when they're in a stretch of answering a lot of things. I'll just throw something in there. I'll be like, oh, my uh, Vinny Tortorich is on Twitter right now. Let me ask him about, like, well, what is better, bacon or sausage? I mean, That's what I did. That's how I ended up with the response of Google it. Because I just tried to come up with a question very fast. He could have been, he could have been, yeah, you, you were funny, but, uh, but he could have been, he could have been funnier. <laughs> yeah, I know. I just wanted a response, so I had to come up with a question. Well, you, you done good, kid. <laughs> <laughs> done good. And, no, you done good. Yeah, I know. Okay, Like, sorry. like, fucking A. <laughs> fucking A. Watch <laughs> the movie? Great movie. Oh, so, uh, earlier this week, um, while well, Zach and I were texting back and forth, I just text him flatly, fucking A. Like, no capital A, no no period, no grammar, grammatical, what have you. And then, and I was, uh, I was quoting, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, what's his name, Lawrence, um, uh, Peter's uh, neighbor in office space, uh, the construction worker who he just he just always says fuck an egg. That's just like that's just his thing he says. <laughs> And that led to Zach telling me, oh, I hadn't seen Office Space yet. And that's that's way more egregious than goddamn Wayne's World. You can go your whole life without watching Wayne's World, but Office Space, that one is probably ensconced in my permanent top ten movies all time just for how awesome it is and how quotable it is. I mean... Yeah, it was actually an incredible movie. I never exactly. even heard of it. Zach gave it an 8.7 out of 10, and I didn't argue that. That's a very high score, so I mean... I'm very good movie. It should be in the nines, but I probably would give it a... A nine five, nine six. I mean, it's up there. Oh, I'm a very low not, score. Well, as we should be, but I mean, it's it's a as well. Now that you've seen it, everyone out there within the uh, sound of our voices has seen Office Space, I'm sure, and they would all agree that it is a very airtight, very good movie. So, very good. Do you? Uh, but do you like any other Mike Judge's works, like Beavis and Butthead or Idiocracy? Not really. I've watched Beavis and Butthead a few times, but not the biggest fan. It was. It's an. Inter- that's an interesting cartoon. I, I enjoyed Beavis and Butthead immensely growing up because it was the show that my parents wouldn't let me watch. Like my dad would wa- wouldn't let me watch it because it's like you know religious overtones of my grandparents. But then there was my mom when I'd go see her, where she's like, "Hey, you can watch that. You can do whatever." And uh, essentially, <laughs> I remembered the cartoon sketches, like the storyline in between them roasting the music videos and critiquing the music videos, was actually pretty flimsy. Like. They could have just had a half hour of them watching music videos and bullshitting. That it actually that actually was pretty good. It was pretty funny. I mean, and then uh, the movie Idiocracy. I think I've told you about it before. It's another Mike Judge vehicle. It's kind of a B list movie, but it's full of A list actors. And the reason why I asked my golf today, I'm like, "You seen Idiocracy?" He's like, "You're the second person in four days to ask me that." And I'm like, "Yeah, well, because every month this planet exists, we're creeping towards this like gym short wearing, Gatorade swilling." barely have any language, always masturbating and shitting at the same time. I mean, you gotta watch it. It's a good movie. I'll watch it. <laughs> so, um, anyways, yeah, and also, uh, Dumbleford, he got, a uh, he got tweeted, uh, from Phil. I forgot, what did he say? Uh, or what, what did Phil say to him? Uh, it was, it was a short answer. I'm not even sure exactly what he said. I could really get it quick. for you if you, uh, go on a bit of a tangent. Well, the tangent I'll go on is cracking a cold one here. From uh, Hop Valley, I'm having an Alphadelic IPA. Hop Valley is a really nice brewery in Bend, Oregon. Bend, Oregon is in Central Oregon, United States of America, and it's uh, the bullseye of the state, essentially. And they make a lot of good beer. They make abandoned pale ale that's called abandoned pale ale. What do you got, Zach? So, Dumbledore said, We are now living in a world where Phil Mickelson is a fitness icon on tour, Tiger averages a major championship and surgery a year, and Brooks gets body shamed for his SI picks. Can't call it, man. Can't, Can't call, call it. it. Phil's answer? Yep. <laughs> Phil can just, like, crank those off. Like, I was reading it to the point, like, reading the timeline of tweets to the point where I'm like, Oh my god, did Phil just answer him just casually, just like that? Is that the same at Phil Mickelson? I mean... Good for hey, good for you guys, man. That's that's fun stuff. Yeah, any answer is a good answer if it's coming from Phil. And speaking of uh, uh, potential trolls or uh, Twitter sensations, uh, be damned. I just found out within the past hour while I was waiting for us to record uh, that I guess yeah, Peter Kessler. I'm just going to get to the end of it. Has a new uh, publicist or something like that or representative because he has unblocked a ton of people and lots of people are liking my tweet that I just put. I put Not me, sadly. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, it doesn't doesn't mean dick. I mean, I found out if you Google Peter, Peter Kessler Twitter, you can read his tweets. I mean, it's not impossible. And he wasn't even talking about us, so I mean, if he was talking to other people, fucking whatever. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm scared for Peter Kessler for his own sake, and I'm even more scared for anyone who considers themselves a fan. This was kind of like, like I said, you brought the beehive into the house, Zach. I didn't care about bees, now I hate bees. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs> I wonder what he was thinking, though. If he, per- I just picture him personally unblocking you and being like, that fucking Zach, fucking Tucker. But Jerry, eh, I'll let him read my tweets. <laughs> Or maybe, maybe Peter just has like a real short list of like when the representative was going to clean things up. He's like, yeah, but not that Tucker guy, not that, not that from the back tees. It's those wounds are still fresh. For sure. Peter Kessler, if you're hearing this, I do. I, I'm actually very happy you unblocked me. I'm possibly thinking about mending, uh, mending a fence here and uh, and uh, building some bridges over that fence. And that I would like to say, no matter what, how everything has turned out so far. Thank you. He has gotten us a few more extra eyeballs and traffic to our website and our entity, 
And he even called that. He said that. He said we were going to get a little. He's like, it's like if you're looking for a little publicity boost, here it is. It's just like I knew we that are. That I thought was happening. Yeah, that's what I thought was happening at the time. I'm like, well, that's the best thing that can happen is maybe this will get as high as ESPN. But he, Peter Kessel feuds don't pop up on the news ever. So it's exactly what we we're doing. Perfect. Oh, uh, guy Stacy just replied to me. Unblocked me too. Bit disappointed to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> What's the world coming to? We're all getting along, dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. It was a tight knit group of people blocked by Peter Kessler, and now you're not part of it. You won't yeah, be invited just, to our meetings. Now, now I'm just like one of those like background people in the suits in the Matrix or whatever, just like wearing all the gray when everyone else is wearing gray. I just blend back into the crowd. We need to like piss off Randall Chambly. Yes, Honestly, I, him. I don't mind Randall Chambly. Like, that would be a good guy to get blocked by. Nah, no. I would actually be upset to be blocked by Brandel Chambly because watching him interact and watching him just say things is very entertaining. That's like, true. That's, and to be fair, I guess the reason why I don't talk shit to Brandel Chambly ever is because I agree with more than half the stuff he says in the first place. I mean, you got, folks, I'm a Johnny Miller guy, too. I'm sorry, you might not like him. <laughs> Screw it. The guy just... The guy I love just Johnny plays. Miller. Oh. Oh, oh Jesus. Pause. Tucker, Tucker just sent me... No, it's okay. Tucker just sent me interesting something interesting on Twitter... I don't know if it's a joke, but we're going to check it out right now. Quality radio. I like this. Uh, that said Peter Kessler died February 5th, 1862. Oh, it's a it's a joke of an old tombstone. Jesus, Pete. <laughs> you people are sick. Um, anyway, so... I don't know. I Going back to the Brandel Chambly thing, it's like he actually... Since I agree with more than half the stuff he says, I don't feel the need to poke at him because it's like, well, he doesn't know who I am, and I like his material, so it's there's no reason, you know, we're just both driving on our own streets. I mean, do you think he believes most of what he says, or deep down he has like a burner account where he like loves every single thing Brooks Kepka says and like retweets it all? I sincerely believe that Brandel Chambly is 100% transparent in who he is. I don't think that's and there's any. Uh, any, I don't think fallacy is the right word or whatever. But or Really? I think it's more of a Max Kellerman thing, like how he always says Tom Brady's going to suck this year. I feel like that's Brandel Chambly coming after Brooks Kepka, But deep down, he like, well, likes see, him. If there was more of a variety of golf personalities out there, maybe. I think Brandel Chambly is just one of the more honest people of the bunch. Like, a lot of people in media want to keep their mouths shut and keep their blinders on so they keep their jobs. Brandel, is, is he really all that inflammatory? Is he really all that opinionated? And if he's the most, okay. I mean, it's like saying Jim Furyk's the longest hitter on tour right now. Really? Really? I mean, okay. I That's mean, why we started this thing. We need some more opinions in the golf world. Everyone's too boring. Well, I mean, what, but then, then we all, but we also have to legitimize ourselves. Because who are we? Like, I've read in one of our comments, and That's to the true. dozens and dozens of you who are listening to this, thank you again. But I remember one person said, it's like listening to two guys sitting in a golf cart talking golf. Or, or just whatever for an hour. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, we can we can we can work with that. I mean, that's true. But we give good opinions, not like uh, I find the people on TV all they do is give the same opinion back and forth. Like, oh, well, the trouble very is bland. Half the, half the golf personalities on TV have no golf background except for they like play in corporate retreats. I mean, they're all like uh, they all like went to Harvard to get economics degrees, and now they work in accounting or like they're just like pencil pushers and things like that they don't golf or have personalities no, yet yeah, they're golf personalities that being said, it's like that's like saying the biggest fish in the tank is only three feet long i mean it's just like really that's it i mean brandall chambly if you look back to his like golf career or whatever v- just as quiet i mean he's just a very vanilla guy and, and he stands out because there's really nothing no one else like and max kellerman i just ignore him i mean it's like colin coward was the same way and then eventually colin coward grew on me honestly i was like yeah this guy's actually pretty cool i, I like his opinions i mean fair fair <laughs> fair fair so um oh good grief yeah we had a foggy morning on the course today if anyone saw my uh, twitter account probably could only see about 50 yards in front of us for the front nine really it was uh, pretty soupy yeah it's been yeah. pouring here all day too Bad weather all around. I don't know, man. Yesterday, it got to... I played some golf, and it was like 90, 95 degrees. It, and it felt like Colorado sunshine, where when, when, when I legitimately felt 8,000 feet closer to the sun. Like, I'd step outside, and I'd, I'd look up at the sun and go, ow! I mean, it was like... It was, it was stinging. I mean, it must be brutal playing in the fog, because I know on tour, they, they like, stop play when there's crazy fog. Fog is... 
is the most upsetting of all of Mother Nature's things to do to me to golf because, and it's doubly upsetting because it's not anything that like makes you wet or makes you uncomfortable. You just can't see. Or, or like you can't see, which means you can't. I mean, you can't really. It's hard to play if you can't see. Oh, and number two, you can't see our views. Like we have some kick-ass views. Isn't that what makes a, high, a golf course high ranked? It's like the course itself and the views around it. I mean, that's. I've said that before about California courses. They're lucky they got that fucking ocean there. No, it's true. The views are what people pay for. Yeah. But, uh, anywho. Uh, it's, the, the fog is really... It's it's neat, but it's like... Let's just say you were to go there as a golfer every year or whatever. You play there for like four rounds uh, for your trip. Having one day or one nine holes of fog is fine. But if you're a caddy and you see fog come in, you're just like, okay, I've seen this a dozen times before, and the first 11 times, it, it actually wasn't fun at all. It, like, it turns out it sucked. So, I mean, it, it, it's it's the same reason why, like, us caddies are, like, always focused on the job and take the scenery for granted, because it's like we're riding the roller coaster for the 10th time that day, and you're just getting on your first roller coaster of your life. I mean, it's, you, the, your senses are being assaulted from just, like, the sights, the sounds. I mean, hell, it's been a little briny smelling lately, too, but... But yesterday we were the first group off at 7 a.m. on Bandon Dunes, and my God, it was, whew, it was, like, I was, I think I chugged a Gatorade in 20 seconds, just absentmindedly. Like, I just sat there drinking, next thing I realized, oh, I'm halfway done, may as well just finish it. <laughs> really? This, this is a very random question I just thought of. Who's the best golfer you ever caddied for? Uh, that I caddied for, that'd be my friend Brian Trobin, Trowbridge. Shout out um, Brian Trowbridge. I think I mentioned him on the pod before. Um, I caddy for him last December and recently again, about when we started up the pod. But um, he's a plus two handicap, and he he just steps up to the ball and like and hits like on one hole, like number eight at Bandon Dude. He says it's like it's a tradition. He always tees up a ball on a can of beer. And uh, oh, Mike Whalen said, "Could he be a vampire?" <laughs> uh, I got I got to stop looking at the phone. There's, there's too much funny on Twitter right now. Um, but um, on two tees, on number eight tee at Bandon, down the fairway, and number four tee Pacific into the ocean, he always ceremoniously like hits a ball, drives a ball off a 16 ounce beer can, and he peers the fudge out of it. Like it, it, it turns out, when you hit off a beer can, it does take off about 50 yards. But I mean, he still hits it like 250. Like, and, he, and he always looks at me and he winks at me and says, "The trick is to leave a little beer in the bottom of the can." That's the trick, folks. If you ever want to hit the ball off a can of beer, that's the hard part. But make sure you leave an inch in the bottom of the can so it doesn't blow away. <laughs> <laughs> that but seems a, fair. Yeah, he. I'd say Brian's probably a plus one, plus two handicap. Very good golfer. Like the first six holes I ever caddied for him, he had a uh, uh, three birdies, two pars, and a bogey. I mean, and I remember on his third birdie, he slapped me on the ass and said, "Like, man, we're reading these putts great." And I said, and I was just like, "You bet." In my head, I was like, "I didn't read one putt so far. This guy's just automatic." I mean, not too shabby. Have they ever had any big level events? Well, we did. We have had a handful. We've had um, the Curtis Cup, the Walker Cup, um, the USGA Four Ball, the US Amateur Four Ball. This summer was not one of the biggest, well, one of the biggest, but not the biggest that we've had there. Um, next year, having the US Amateur, that will be the biggest event that's come through so far. But nothing tour related. Um, yeah, why do you think they don't get anything? Or maybe they will. The simple answer: there's uh, there's no logic. There's absolutely no lodging. In There's the, no room for seats or anything, too, probably. If you, if a regular tour event were to show... Oh, they'll figure that out. Who cares? But, I mean, if you were to put a regular tour event in uh, at Band and Dunes, uh, you take all the lodging in the county, you'll cover the sta the press only. I mean, it's just there's only 30,000 people in this county. It's a very depressed economy, le very big lack of infrastructure. The only thing be actually, there's a new building being built in my town, and it's an extension onto a bank, and that's because that bank is an Oregon bank, and their headquarters is in my town for some reason. It just, like, there's, I'm not seeing any new businesses come in anywhere, and now that the resort has gotten so big and so powerful and, and it's so quality, golfers don't need to go into the town of Bandit, which is five miles actually south of the resort. It's like everything you need from, t like, half a dozen quality restaurants and people are there just to golf, not to go buy seashell necklaces and, like, go have local clam chowder. I mean, it's, you know, it's a lot of fun, but... Fair enough. But, um, but yeah, that was, uh, he was, uh, Brian, he's the best. And, actually, he was supposed to come out before Labor Day. I, I he kept, his excuse, because our mutual friend is Scott Milhauser, the head pro over at Man and Trails, and he said that he was texting Brian the other day, because I would just, uh... 
he, I'll, I'll just cut to the chase. He said uh, Brian evidently couldn't find anyone to come down to play because Salem, Oregon is only about four hours away from Bannon Dunes. And he kept saying he couldn't find anyone to play, so I just tweeted Brian saying, well, how about you just get your ass down here by yourself and me and Scott will play with you. I mean, and he's just like, yeah, we could probably do that. I mean, haven't heard from him since, so... Brian, get your shit together. Come on. Oh, damn it, Brian. <laughs> you sickened me. You, you disgust me. So, yeah, uh, Peter Kessler, um, thank you very much for everything. I'm just checking off notes here. Blah, blah, blah. So, um, you got a, uh, we got an interview that we're going to plug in at the back end of this podcast. Why don't you tell the folks about that, Zach? Yeah, so, actually, one of the guys, I used to train at a tennis academy out in Florida, and the, one of the golf instructors there goes by the name of Francis Biondi, and he's turned up quite a career in f- golf and cooking, so he's now on the mini tours for golf, trying to make it big, and he's actually doing a lot of charity work and, like, advertisements for that kind of thing. And then he was actually on MasterChef Season 5, so I'm sure we got some MasterChef fans there, and if not, just suffer your way through it. I need to watch out for, um, uh, how do you say, uh, cooking shows, because I I only watch a couple, and then I start getting obsessed. And then my best friend, he's a a restaurant manager, so, like, whenever we're watching TV, he's like, anything but cooking shows, like, oh, cake. Yeah, and he was one of the featured guys on the on the season. You know, there's always like a couple guys who are fan favorites. He was one of those, so it was exciting to watch someone you know. And uh, we got some good some good talking in. He gave some good cooking advice. Excellent. Oh, some wait. behind the scenes of Master Chef and uh, his goal to make it to the PGA Tour. If anything, I have to listen to that. Listen just for that, folks. That you think you think I listen to this podcast? I don't. But nope. I listen to the interviews, though, because uh, Zach does a tremendous job, and one day I will be available enough and brave enough to join him on an interview. But as of right now, I'm just hoping Skype sponsors us, because uh, as I was telling you earlier, I think Google's wise to me, so I literally went to go make a new email account to go to use on Skype. Skype hasn't really been, like, giving me the red banner lately, but I kept, like, deleting it and reinstalling it. And so I go to make Jerry Lou, po- Jerry Lou Pod 17 at gmail.com, and then there's one step that says enter a phone number in to send the verification code. Now, it used to be or enter an email in, but they were just giving me the phone number only option. So I type in my phone number, a little red thing says, this phone number has uh, been used too much. <laughs> oh, so now it's Google who got me. I, I thought it was going to be Skype, but uh, as of right now, we're still having a handshake. So Skype, Hot Valley, we can go for some sponsors. I don't care. One day, uh some guy by the name of Jerry Lou who has another podcast is going to go to Skype and try and make Jerry Lou pod, and he's going to be amazed by the fact that, like, 472 Jerry Lou pods at gmail.com have been invented. There's only 16. Well, 17. So yeah, far. Probably, there was just a Jerry Lou pod, and then Jerry Lou pod too. Okay, no, there's 16. There were 16 at gmails for Jerry Lou pods. Numerical so far. Order. Exactly. When you're listening so, uh, next week, there'll be 17. God forbid. Um, do you uh, do you have a Canadian fun fact of the week for us? I want to get into the questions, but I do. So, okay. do you know that Ulaanbaatar is the coldest capital city in the world, averaging negative one point three degrees Celsius for the year? But Canada has the seventh coldest capital in the world, Ottawa. Do you know how cold it is? Let's let's rewind real quick. Where? What's that first? Ulaanbaatar, the capital of Mongolia, oh. minus 1.3. Okay, when you, the way you said that, I, I didn't hear the first part. I was just like, what the hell counted the country? What? Yeah, um, no, for all our fans in Ulaanbaatar, sorry for that. Do you happen to have the, uh, the latitudinal bearing? <laughs> no, I, I do not. Oh, okay. <laughs> the, but uh, Ulaanbaatar is minus 1.3 Celsius, and this is the seventh coldest. I'm going to say, I don't, I don't know, man. I don't know sales centigrade. Uh, minus 10, does that work? No. Well, if the coldest is minus 1, how could the 7th coldest be colder? Oh, oh, no, I thought you said the 7th coldest was 1. No, no, the first coldest is minus 1.3. Oh, for God's sakes. Okay, then 0? Uh, no, 5.5 degrees. Okay, see, Not I, that I'm cold. So, I'm so bad with centigrade. I really, really am. Like, it's... Like that—that's only because Americans, 
like are trained in Fahrenheit, but at the same time, it's like an imperial system. It's like, yeah, but we use feet and inches and yards for golf, and everyone likes that worldwide. They just they mostly put up with that. But when it comes uh, to like, oh my god, to, that that just throws me off every time. But Jesus in Christ. in January, the average temperature is minus fourteen point eight degrees centigrade. Good grief! Do you want to guess which countries are two through six? <sighs> Let's see, uh, Russia. Russia's three, Moscow, 4.1. Uh, uh, okay, I'll, I'll say the capital too if I'm smart enough. We got uh, Helsinki. That's four, 4.5. We got uh, Oslo. Nope. Okay, uh, how about Reykjavik? Yeah, that's five, uh, 4.6. I'm gonna, here, give me a half a point for Greenland. I don't know. I no, I'd be shocked if you get these two. Really? Uh, maybe you'll get it, but... Uh, okay. Here, uh, one, number two has a relation to a comedy movie. Oh, don't do it. To the, that's, uh, that's Kazakhstan. Yeah, Astania, 3.5. Number 6. Oh, wait, 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 stop. Then then this one's got to be like Azerbaijan or something. No, or, uh, you're never going to get um, it. Um, uh, Uzbekistan. Nope. You uh, give up? Georgia. No. <laughs> Georgia's a country, don't laugh at me. Yeah, no, I know it's a country, but you're never going to get it. Uh, uh, it starts with an E, the country. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's Estonia, Tallinn. Oh, okay. I, if if you would, if somebody would give me twenty minutes, I probably would have pulled that eventually out of my ass after Latvia. And really, I, I would have never Latvia. guessed Estonia. I would probably just forget Estonia as a country if I didn't read it there. Estonia is like a country the size of Rhode Island, above two other countries the size of Rhode Island, that's sandwiched between uh, Russia and whatever waters between Finland and Russia. Yeah, that was impressive uh, geography knowledge by you, though. I'm pretty good, man. <laughs> you went three, four, five right away. Well, I mean, it, I was trying to think to myself. It's like, well, in the northern hemisphere, or I mean, in the western hemisphere, what do you got? You just have Greenland and Canada. That's it. And America does not have their capital in Juneau. And by the way, it's not that cold in Juneau, folks. Um, that being said, I, I just thought to myself, well, then just nail the three Scandinavian countries. And then Russia, I mean, Jesus, we pretty much described about 90% of the Arctic Circle touchers right there, so... Fair. Well, thank you. That was that was fun. I appreciate that. So, shall we get to some Twitter questions here? We shall. All right. Uh, the first one I got here that we'll uh, throw up is uh, where is it? Where is it? Mia ta ta ta. Your girlfriend deleting her tweets. Skip <laughs> that. Skip that. Um, there he is. It's from my boy Matt Smith. Shout out to Smitty. He's a friend of uh, Tyler Shout out Child, Smitty. Who, uh, Tyler Childs is a co-host with Robbie on the Dingers Baseball Podcast at Dingers Pod. You can follow them on uh, Twitter, and uh, they do a lot of great stuff over there. Hilarious content through and through. Like I, I find myself, I gotta kind of stop listening to their podcast sometimes because I want to make ours sound just like theirs. Where I'm just like, whoa, 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 whoa. That's their phrases. That's their saying. Stop it. So, that being said. Um, I caddied for Tyler and this guy Smitty, and he had a two-part question. I'm going to skip the second part because I addressed it with a GIF. Um, but the first question was: Will Brooks sign an equipment deal? Zach, what do you think? I think yes because he wants money, and who doesn't want money? He'll probably sign with some like Jordan brand or something, or something that like, or some company well, that like, doesn't even affect him. What like Lonzo Ball's dad's company? Yes, exactly. Like Whoever pays him the most and is like a cool brand, he'll be in. He'll be the fourth ball brother. How do you, great? Hey, yeah. How do you know? How do you know that he wants money? Like you made that. You said that very matter of factly. Like, well, I, I feel know like we all want money. I feel like he just doesn't care that much about the golf, and he just cares about like having a good time. So he'll be like, "Well, if I get these cool like pure gold clubs, may as well take them." I don't know. See, I I appreciate where you're going with that, but I did, I guess I disagree because I look at it like where we we would have seen that already with him. That's that's not him. That's the opposite of him, in my opinion, is how big his bank account is. I think he gives, like, four less fucks than we do. I mean, or four fewer, excuse me for the language. But that being said, I, I, I just, I feel like that, that wouldn't be very on-brand of Brooks Kepka to sign a deal for that reason, what you said, for because he likes slash needs the money or whatever. I mean, it's... Well, he definitely doesn't need the money. I hope let's not. Look, let's look at, here's another good example. It's like, why do you think Dustin Johnson with Taylor made? Sorry? Why do you think Dustin Johnson? Why do you think DJ's with Taylor made? Because they pay him the most. But he can. A lot of these guys can play with any of these clubs. It's not like they're making these clubs for him. 
I also have a hot take that I think some of these guys might have different clubs that are just painted to look like other clubs because that's what they do in tennis and hockey. Well, that, that's certainly possible, and I know that that goes against uh, what we know with Mizuno, how they made those irons for Kepka. And I do know that the tailor-made driver faces are made thicker on the bottom now because of guys like DJ and everyone wanting to hit it like DJ. But, but then we can think that now to the whole, like, you can hit a cut now and not lose distance. Like, that's, yeah. that's the whole, like... Hook and a slice go the same amount unless there's wind in your face. I mean, it's it's, it's a weird freaking world we live in. But, but it's so why do you think though. he does it? Well, I'm not. I don't necessarily. I all I was arguing was I don't think he does it for the money. I mean, I think I I guess it would be one of those things where it's like, shucks, I can't decide if I, I just don't think he. W- I guess to answer the question, I don't think he will sign an equipment deal. I mean, Ryan Moore played without a, a clothing contract for a while, and he acted like an asshole. But I guess, yeah, but so, most players who sign equipment deals or any form of deal, it's for the money in general. It's otherwise, yes, I, I don't know. That that just seems too that just seems too one dimensional to me. That just seems too. I don't want to use the word shallow because that can implicate a lot of other negative things that I'm we're not getting at. But I mean, I just I feel like there's way more to it than just. Well, it's like even money. Tiger switched. What do you, wait, wait, what do you mean? When Tiger, Tiger switched to the Nikes. Well, but that was that was because uh, th- this isn't a hot take, and nobody get all racial on my ass. But that was because Nike owned Tiger, and eventually you know, yeah. he had to play Nike stuff. Or in and the they, NBA, as they say, they, they governed had, him. They had to work out so many designs. Do you see how long it took him to finally play Nike irons? And he never got the Nike putter down ever. I mean, they just. And that's and that's just a hunk of freaking metal, milled metal. That's it. Oh yeah, but it was because of the money. He could have said no. But, but I but I'm pretty sure back in the day, no, like players don't have as much have a lot more rights these days. But that they get that up front, they know that the comp- companies aren't demanding as much anymore because the second if anyone approached a player like Nike approached Tiger Woods these days, that that was a that was a marriage for those two. But any company would say, F off, you're not going to literally own me and like contractually whatever. I mean, and, and Dustin Johnson doesn't pick TaylorMade for the money. He makes like $5 million a year. He doesn't need money. I mean, none of these guys... No, but neither did money. Tiger. Tiger could have said, screw you guys and just break his contract with Nike. Yeah, but that's... Why would he do that? Well, if he doesn't need the money and he thinks he'll play better with the other ones. See, you're going way too black and white on this. This is way too... You're way too polarized on this, which is fine, but that's not what it's all about at all. It's... I the, mean, the, 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 to be honest, I, I look at equipment deals as it doesn't matter what they freaking play. They're going to whoop each other's asses no matter. I mean, it's like you can give them all tailor-made clubs or all Callaway irons, and they're all going to compete very, very yeah, well. Yeah, for sure. But that, but that being said, it's just like just because they didn't sign with Titleist did, doesn't mean they didn't need the money. It's not about the money all the time. No, it's not about the money, but if it's a slight the, difference, they'll take the money. Well, of course, Tiger, Tiger must have knew he was gonna. It was gonna be difficult to switch. No, but it, Tiger, the biggest name in golf, Nike, the biggest name in sports. That's a very specific instance that that it, I, I don't want to say can be compared to many other guys like that. I or mean, even Justin like, Rose switching to Hanma. Well, he made so much money in his life. Yeah, but but th- okay, no, there's a good example right there that he switched to Hanma because he did, he can play any freaking sticks he wants. Exactly, to, and. and I don't think Japanese companies give much money because you don't see anyone sponsored by them on tour. I would guess they paid him a huge amount, though, because he was number see, one. See, now this is what started me asking. It's like, how do you know this? Like, like I, I would I, guess I, he's paid a huge amount. They're a big company. They seem to advertise a lot. I haven't heard of Hanma until like four years ago, seriously, in mainstream. I was aware of them, like Yonix. Well, in Japan, though, they're huge. Like, like Mira. Yeah, in Japan. And then in Russia, they have the Bolishnikits irons, too, I'm sure. I mean, <laughs> what, what, what are we talking about here? But I hate to say it. I don't mean to be very pro-American or, like, Western skewed on this, but if everyone's going to have all eyes on the PGA Tour and the Tour, and that's where the top 200 golfers want to be, the best golfers or whatever, and they know they're going to have the most eyeballs and cameras on them, they're going to come to America. And shitty, stupid corporate America and capitalism plays by that set of rules. So, I mean, it's just... I can't explain why Hanma's not bigger over here. But what do you think Justin Rose's main motivation for switching to Hanma was? I have, that's what, it was weird. I have no clue. I have no clue. I, uh, maybe he's having a midlife crisis? I don't know. I, <laughs> I, I, I was actually happy he did so I could be like, well, good, maybe we can see some Hanma in action. But I need to see a bigger swath of like players playing it. Case in point, PXG, if those are really the best irons, how come their eight flagship players aren't winning every tournament? I've said that before. Yeah, well, I, I mean, think it's more the player than the club. Of, well, 
Duh, but I'm, okay. All right, don't don't bite your tail here. I'm saying that to counter your other point, but then you're saying something else to go down another road here. I mean, it's yeah, no, but that's why the players. I think they could very easily change clubs, and it might take a little bit to figure it out. But in the end, I think the number one player could use whatever major club, obviously not some like shitty wood clubs, and they'd still find a way to get back to the top. Okay, sure, okay, but here, here's a fact, though. All the golf balls that all the tour players are using right now, every single golf ball you see hit on TV that's not a range ball, and those range balls are actually pretty special, too. They're all branded for what they want. Those, you think the guys who are playing Pro Vs right now are playing the same Pro Vs that came out of a sleeve at Walmart? Or no. Or like, like, no, they're like customized. Half of their bag is stuff that isn't necessarily souped up or engineered, but stuff we're never going to see our eyeballs or let alone get our little dick skinners onto. It's just that the pros live in such a weird echelon. or what. That's why I don't like us having the same set of rules. They play with completely different equipment. I mean, it's just, and, and, and they're better, and they're better. I mean, it goes hand in hand. I mean, a lot of the equipment's designed for them. I know this because my new irons are extra stiff shafts, and i got to man up. <laughs> Fair. Should we go to the next question? On to the uh, next yeah, one. I, I guess I don't. I I don't think Brooks will get an equipment deal just because it's like. Does he need one? No. If he doesn't, he doesn't care, doesn't yeah. Out. I mean, and in this day and age, you don't need one. That's what I'm trying to say. Well, yeah, they're all so rich. That's for sure. And all the guys under the TaylorMade fold, I just look at them and go, "Good for them." That's like having people all advertising for Ford or something. It's just like Ford's a shitty car, but look, they got like Dale Earnhardt there. Okay, whatever. It to be there. Like they're both paying each other, technically. I mean, anyways. Uh, so, uh, next question. Uh, are, is our website sexist? <laughs> is our website sexist? I would say no. We just have some pictures of really hot girls on it every once in a while. And people like to click on it. So, if you think it's sexist, don't click on it. And then we'll stop putting it up as people stop viewing it. Look, and, and folks... Okay. <laughs> I was going to say, golf is about sex. And I'm like, well, what's that trying to do here? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, goodness. Um, all right, next question. This one's kind of directed at me, and then we'll ask, then we have a nice uh, wrap up question uh, from John on staff. It gets back to the old uh, tour championship versus um, player of the year thing. Uh, Trevor at TAC, TAC, at, oop, let me try that again. Trevor at TAC 6 TAC, that's T A K 6 T A K, tweeted, he said, Would you want to be a tour caddy and do you pursue it? Would you do similar world tours or just Corn Ferry PGA? Speaking for strictly myself and being a caddy at uh, Ben Dunes Golf Resort, I would have to make an insane amount of extra money now than I do now to take another job because I'm home every night. I, I don't have to travel. I don't have to worry about anything. The performance of my golfer really only directly affects my mood and it doesn't affect anyone's bank accounts or like world rankings or anything like that. I mean, I, as much as I'd, I'd love to be a caddy on tour, I'm really happy doing what I'm doing. That being said, as I've said many, many times before, the path to getting on tour, I firmly believe, and a lot of people say this too, is hitching your wagon to the right young gun at the right time. And by young gun, I mean somebody who's like maybe freshman in college at the oldest we're talking, like somebody who's still a late teenager. And then here I had that kid a week ago, Cash, that 11-year-old, who I got his folks telling me, hey, uh, can you be his caddy for tournaments or whatever? I'm just like, well, Jesus, in 10 years, I, he could be on tour, I could be his caddy, but I'll be like, you know, like getting Christmas presents from the family or whatever. Like, that's how I built that relationship, so to speak. I mean, the 11's way too young. I did not think that would happen, but kid never had a caddy before, and he re played really good, and he really liked me, so whatever. Um, let me, and that's, I would say, though, that you would have to, I would have to be a caddy on the PGA Tour full-time if I were to want to leave what I'm doing now. And that does speak highly of what I do right now. I mean, that is saying something. But that being said, it's like, maybe if I was single and, like, I didn't have as much, like, possessions or stuff or whatever, yeah, I'd go be a Corn Ferry caddy tour, a, a tour caddy, because, I mean, it's like, the cost, you know, fly by the seat of your pants, just worry about where your next six-pack's coming from. I mean, kind of sounds appealing on one hand, but on the other hand, it's like, nah, I'd have to regress to get to that point. <laughs> It's true. It's definitely a risky move, but it could pay off, and it's it's not too bad if you catch on with the right person. Yeah, that is true. So we'll finish up with our last question here. This is from John Cherepsky. He's a uh, our uh, LPGA writer on staff and a and a great chap on Twitter. He's always down to uh, to rebut with you. His uh, and his uh, Twitter handle. I'll just give it here. Is by the LPGA. way, we must be the only people with an LPGA writer. So for all you sexist people, quit hating on us. 
Um, you can find John at J Cherepsky. It's C H E R E P S K I. His question was, why was the tour champion not the player of the year? Every year I read that the money list, excuse me, every year, dot, 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 I read that the money list ended the week before the tour championship. What do you think, Zach? Uh, so I think, I guess part of it could be a little bit of luck. Like, you could win all four majors and not win. Did he say the tour championship? Or the... Well, what he was saying was how come the tour championship isn't in... Well, now that I'm reading this, I'm reading a little deeper, but, deeper, but he said, why was the tour champion not the player of the year? I think he's, he's been making it sound like um, they stopped the... Uh, I don't know. Did they stop the FedEx Cup points like or, or something? like Or the voting... Like, they vote before the tour championship? Well, yeah, That's... I guess the most extreme, you could win all four majors and not even be in the tour championship. Because the points or, don't okay. carry over from everything. Sure, and you'll also be the richest guy. And well, wait—if you win all the majors, won't you like destroy in FedEx Cup? I mean, no, but you still wouldn't. You still don't necessarily. You might not be in the top thirty. Tiger wasn't it? Shane Lowry wasn't even close. Interesting. Oh, I just thought. Uh, Maybe if you win all four, it would probably be pretty close. But let's say you win three. No, it's a good point because Shane Lowry really didn't win anything else or show up anywhere else. Same with Tiger, so to speak. Whereas I'm looking at it going like, well, if you win all four majors, I thought in, in terms of like the, the FedEx Cup points, I'm assuming that they weight the points for the majors and the, and the tour events the same way. If so, if you win, what, like, wouldn't you say like the guy who wins the most events every year is at five a year? That seems to be like a pretty good number. Like we're not in the Tiger days anymore where you win more than that, but it's like... Oh, I don't think anyone even wins five now. Maybe three. Three or four. I mean, each, DJ used to win five here or there, and uh, VJ did it once, and, uh, and, uh, uh God. Yeah, but let's say you win five anyways, you could still not win the Tour Championship. How many did Rory win this year? Four? Two, I think. <laughs> it's only two? I mean, the players and... I saw he came top ten in, like, well over half. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, to me, is why he won the Tour Championship. I don't know, John, that's, that's a really good question. I thought... Rereading it, I guess my mind took a different turn, but um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I just I would say there's definitely a correlation. The tour champion's definitely more likely to win the player of the year, but I think for sure you could win player of the year without winning the tour championship. You could just have a really good season and have a bad two tournaments. Who was the player of the year last year on on tour? Kepka. I think Justin Rose was. No, Justin Rose was the FedEx Cup winner. Tiger Woods won the Tour Championship, and I'm hoping it was that, uh, as you're looking it up, it was Brooks Kepka who won Player of the Year, because I'm like, boom, we got three different human beings here. Oh, you're right. It was Brooks Kepka. So, Kepka's Player of the Year, Justin Rose won the Fe- wins the FedEx Cup, Tiger won the Tour Championship. I, f- I feel like Will Ferrell and, uh, and Step Brothers were like, hold on a second, hold on a second. You're selling the house, we gotta get jobs, we gotta go to therapy. What the fuck happened? I mean... <laughs> and the money leader last year was Justin Thomas. So... You know what? I guess, um, John, we're going to have to wait and see how this all shakes out this year because it turns out our FedEx Cup winner and our tour champion is the same guy. So that's going to be... I mean, I'm not going to... It was to give you... Uh, Brooks and Rory tied this year with three wins apiece. At the most? Yeah. Oh, gross. I thought it was more than that. Two uh, years ago, Justin Thomas won five. Yeah, you're right. A lot of years they have five. Well, anyways, you got, you got anything else? We're about to hit that uh, hit that interview time. No, I, uh, I got one little fun fact because I'm just going through it. Yeah. Do you know who had the most tour wins in 2013 with five? Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah, I guess. Evidently, Tiger is the only man who can really win a lot. I yeah. Don't know. What happened to Jordan Spieth? Um, He'll be back. He'll be back. Uh, <laughs> I feel this way at the end of every podcast where I'm like, bah, bah. we need him. All right. Well, uh, I guess uh, what we'll try to do, folks, is uh, it won't be maybe on a set day or schedule, but Zach and I will still try to check in on you about once a week, give you some bullcrap to a. Uh, talk about and uh you know what i just have to say to all the haters out there um 
it's not up to us what you're going to be offended by. So um, I'm sorry if you think some of us are racist or sexist or whatever. It could be hey, no one thinks we're racist, so I didn't just put that in there. <laughs> I'm saying in general. No, okay, right. Well, well, hey, hey. evidently everyone's telling you we're a sexist website because I haven't heard Jack. That's true. So I don't know what you've heard and I haven't and vice versa. <laughs> no, we just get the same two people on Twitter. All right. Thanks, Molly. Uh, I think I'm going to go troll Peter Kessler and uh, play some more video games and whatnot. Okay, amazing. Go crush it. We'll be back next week. Absolutely. And uh, you can follow me at Jerry Lou Looper one on Twitter. Zach, where can they find the rest of us? You can find us at our www.fromthebacktees. Go to the About Us. You'll find everyone's Twitter. And hopefully you guys subscribe to the pod, review. We're crushing those reviews. Moving That's us up the to iTunes rank. Absolutely, folks. We appreciate it. We'll uh, see you next week, and uh, make sure you teed up from the back. So I'd like to introduce right now a professional golfer who I've known for some time. He's a man of many talents, not only thriving to make his way on the PJ Tour, but he was also a fan favorite as a finalist on Season 5 of MasterChef. Some of you may know him. Others will learn his name soon. As big things are coming, it's Francis Biondi. Francis, thanks so much for being on. I know we've been trying to get this organized for a while, so it's great to speak with you. Yeah, thanks for having me again. I'm excited to be a uh, be a part of this. Yeah, so uh, I guess before we get started, I'll just bring the fans up to date. We actually know each other from uh, summer camp, where I used to play tennis competitively, and I think you were my RA, if I'm not mistaken. Or yeah, I was, uh, I was one of the resident assistants. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we were at a we were at summer summer camp over at Saddlebrook Resort. Exactly. Over, so, uh, what have you been up to? What have you been up to since then? Yeah, so uh, I still have that, that golf passion, that golf dream alive. i um, keeping it going here in Orlando, Florida. I've uh, been playing on mini tours for a few years when I moved over to here to Central Florida and went out and played some world rank events out in Europe on the Alps Tour. And I've been offered some challenge tour exemptions for the next season. So I've just been you know, gearing up, getting ready for some bigger and better events. Oh, well, that's great. Before we get to all the golf stuff, I feel like it's pretty important to bring up the numerous charities you've actually been involved with. So if you want to elaborate on that and tell our fans how they could support these causes or whatever they could do to help. Yeah, of course. So after MasterChef, I've gotten recognized for for being a, uh, a, a somewhat of a food celebrity in Central Florida, so I did a lot of food demonstrations. I started a little catering, uh, catering business, uh, catering to um, the private individuals who wanted to, to uh, taste some of my delicious offerings, uh, some some of the food for events and parties, uh, birthdays and whatnot. So I ended up doing a lot of that here in Central Florida, and uh, part of my proceeds that. Um, I would get would go towards the Central Florida Second Harvest Food Bank. Um, so there's a food bank in almost every big city, and the Second Harvest Food Bank in Central Florida does really good work for a lot of the homeless and uh, feeding the hungry, not only in Orlando but all throughout Central Florida. So I've been a I've been a part of their work, and I like to continue being a part of what they do and just kind of shed some light on on how we could feed not only the homeless and the hungry but also um, support our uh, support the children and the hungry children out there in America. That's, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I know we have a lot of fans in Florida, so hopefully people check it out. So I know now you mentioned you're gearing up for Q School. Have you? Is this your first time attempting to make it, or have you attempted Q School before? I have attempted Q School in the past, and uh, it's definitely not for the faint of heart. It's, it's something that I think is more of a... You, when you get to a Q School point, you... you recognize that you have some sort of level of skill and from there golf as many people say it's it's really a game played between between the ears it's really on your head so uh, the first time I did it I must admit it was uh, I, I did have a little bit of those butterflies um, I didn't get them flying in flying in order for myself but uh, but the uh, the next time I attempted it with uh, with Alf store I was able to get conditional status and take that to the next level and play uh, five events out there on tour. So 
So I yeah. thought it was a really good progression. It's um, I would definitely recommend it to any person out there looking to play professionally. It's something you have to shoot for. You have to keep on your schedule and really look at that goal every day and tell yourself or ask yourself, you know, one real question is that what what can I do every day to be just a little bit better than the last? Exactly. Yeah, I know we've we're pretty familiar with the McKenzie Tour out in Canada and how you can make it from there to the PGA Tour. What's it like to make it from the Alps Tour? What's like? Uh, do you need to finish top three or something? So for for full Challenge Tour status, which is equivalent to the old Web.com Tour and the now Corn Ferry Tour, so to get full Challenge Tour status, you have to finish top five in your season. So okay. to give yourself that. Uh, that possibility, you have to play as many events as you can on that Alps Tour. Um, and, and they start in February and go all the way through uh, the end of August. Uh, it's October as well. So there are about 16 to 18 events every year, and I, I hope to be able to play a lot more of those next year as I put my schedule together. Yeah, exactly. I guess uh, you've been doing a lot with cooking as well at the same time. So. Yeah, definitely. I've been doing cooking. I'm, I, I love the fact that uh, cooking just brings people together and ignites people under one cause, especially with the charity work that I, I have been able to do. And I want to continue doing that and, and really be able to to get behind or have a, have a, a, a I guess, a culinary branded team behind me to be able to help me realize these goals of not just making it on tour, but also to be able to work with food charities and, and really feed the hungry around the world. Yeah, and what would you say in golf? I know everyone talks about all their strengths. What would you say is your biggest weakness in your game? Biggest biggest weakness in my game? Mm, I think right now, honestly, I, my putting could be a lot better. It used to be my strength. And it's, it's interesting. I'm sure you've seen it with tennis as you are a competitive tennis player. There's, you, it, it, you have to kind of be a well-balanced player, but it's nice to have one edge. And putting was one of my one of my best characteristics of my game until I started focusing on my driving and trying to get longer in my distance. And I stopped putting hours into putting, and now my putting's falling back. So I've, I've learned now that it's not about putting eight to ten hour days in like it used to be. I think you grind to a certain level. You get to a certain uh, handicap, uh, let's say, where you're comfortable shooting under par, and now it's all about practicing more efficiently. You're not trying to tie your body out. You're not really trying to find find your swing after you know hitting 2,000 balls a day anymore. Now it's like, what do I have to do to be more efficient in my game? So now I know, spend a little more time on that putting and less about trying to get that ball out there further. Yeah, exactly. You see a lot on tour now. A lot of the guys are, I guess, especially Brooks Kepka. He's all big about he doesn't practice. And you got guys like Cameron Tringali. I know he only hits shots, I think, from inside 70 yards all year. So I guess he's. Uh, it's all about efficiency now. Yeah, it's very true. Um, when I was out in, in Europe, I worked with a couple of coaches out in South of Spain. So I got to give a shout out to Nick Lynn who's with uh, a golf academy called Total Golf Marbella. And Marbella is a beautiful, beautiful town in the south of Spain. Um, they call it uh, that area, like uh, Costa del Golf. You just have you about 80 courses um, right in that south of Spain area. Uh, you wake up and you overlook the Mediterranean, and you've got these uh, beautiful, beautiful practice facilities. And uh, Nick actually helped teach me how to practice a little bit better and practice properly. Um, we just worked on half shots and learning how to control control the face of the golf club rather than trying to work on full swing mechanics because once you can control the face of the golf club like as you know just like with a small motion controlling the face of the racket you can do pretty much anything so so i've really been working on that just working on uh, shots from 60 to 120 yards obviously you got to get got to get within some good scoring distance when you when you have a shot that's under 120 yards for sure that's what makes a lot of those pros um that's that's what makes them pros really yeah, so I guess, how would you describe your game overall? And if you had to compare yourself to one guy on tour, who would it be? Oh, man, that's a, that's a tough question. That's a good one. I, 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 hate, I, 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 can't, I can't say I hate comparing myself. I don't, I, don't, I don't like to compare myself to other players. I feel like my game is just it's very, it's very individual to me and how I swing. It's very, everyone has a different swing. You know, everyone, everyone does something differently. If I had to compare it, though, being that I have to answer this question. Um, you have no I'd, choice. I'd, I'd, I'd compare 
I, I compare a little bit of my game to, I'd say, like a like a Xander. Okay. You know, maybe the name that people can recognize now. I've been following him for a while. Um, compared with maybe, I'd go with a little bit of. Oh man, I like to be aggressive. I like to be aggressive, like like tired can be. I'd like to think, like when I step up to the ball. The, the, my one swing thought is I just imagine Tiger's full swing with any club I have in my hand. And if I'm thinking driver and I need to smash one off the key, that's my, my swing thought is I, I just I see Tiger's driver swing in my head. Then I try to like, Not a bad copy that. To compare, yeah. And, right, right. Okay. So, I mean, I, I, I wish I could have a little bit of his distance. But, yeah, um, I, but I, 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 I hit a pretty straight ball. I, I, I don't like to bend the ball a lot. I'm not above the Watson off the tee like that. I like to hit a, 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 a straight to fade. If I draw it, it's a straight to fade. And when I talk about fades and draws, I'm talking about a one-yard or two-yard fade or draw. I, I don't okay. like to see the ball start 10 yards into the trees and, and, and you know peel it back in the fairway. But I have that shot if I need it. Yeah, that's all. That's what you need. I wish I could hit it straight or draw or fade. As long as it enters the fairway, I'm happy. <laughs> it's simple, Zach. It's simple. Once you know the basic mechanics, it's, it's simple. Yeah, exactly. You actually mentioned how, at first when I started playing golf, driving was one of my biggest strengths, and then I worked a lot on my short game and stuff. That got I'm a lot better, you, and now the driving is right. gone. I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I just uh, I lost you. Okay. So you were mentioning... You were mentioning before how the putting, for you, it was your strength at the start, and then you started working on other parts of the game, and you lost the putting. For me, when I started, my driving was actually my biggest strength for sure. I was hitting it farther and straighter than I am now, but as soon as I started working on something else, that was it. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's good to have a coach that you can trust, and you can you can trust the process that you're going down the line with a good, a good coach in any sport or, or, or any aspect of life. You have a good mentor. You can trust how they're guiding and leading you, and, and and you start to figure out with your coach how to approach you know your goal, your task at hand. I mean, everyone wants to get longer. Everyone wants to, want, everyone wants to be straighter as far as golf is concerned. Everyone wants to make uh, make more putts. But you know, you have to look at where you are in your game and and what's your next big goal. If your next big goal is to make Q school and make the first first stage of Q school, um, maybe let's say you have it in two weeks from now. I'd honestly say there's no big change you need to be making in your full swing. Obviously, you got to your, a point in your game where you can hit the fairway, you can hit the green, and I'll just make putts and work on those wet shots. But if you have six months to go until Q school or six months to go to like a really big event, then, then you have a little more more, uh, more space, more leeway to, to work on maybe a full swing change or work on a little bit of a mechanic, um, uh, clean up some stuff in your mechanics. But I think all in all for any tournament level golfer, any competitive golfer, I mean, if you can spend 70% of your time on short game shots, 30 yards to 120 yards and putting, and uh, 30% of your time on your, your your long game, I feel that would make every golfer uh, a better player. You'll definitely see, see scores drop for sure. Okay, yeah, and you actually brought up your, your goal, so what would you say your short-term goals are, and in the end, what would you say your career goal is? Sure, uh, career goal definitely have to answer that first is the PGA Tour yeah. um, I, I, I've always told myself that I've always uh, felt that I can make it on tour it's just giving myself a little more opportunities to do that so I think for to do that short term wise I'm going to see myself play some Monday qualifiers I like that route right now um, the Corn Ferry Tour uh, Q School is very rigorous um, it's rigorous and it's a expensive just like you know just, just like other sports especially kind of out there too it's, it's it's a lot of self-funding it's a lot of uh exactly. finding sponsors that can back you to it's it's not as much about like like the, the, the level of talent because you get to a certain level where you are a good player it's just can you afford playing 20 events in a year or can you only afford playing five and you know those other 15 if one of those hits that could be a, a, a change of lifestyle right there so I like the, the Monday qualifier route right now as I get ready for the Canadian tour as as well as uh, European tour. So I have, I have two two angles right now. Uh, Canadian tour uh, qualifying school is coming up, I believe, in uh, February and March of uh, next year. And um, and I have some exemptions that are going to be available to me by uh, by May of next year for a challenge tour. 
so I, I have a couple options right now. Uh, right now, it's about getting getting some funding and getting some backers to see if they uh, want to see me through in, in Europe or Canada. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It's tough in golf and tennis. It's the same. You're you're alone out there, and it's all about who could get one lucky break. It seems. Yeah, it is. It is. It's good. And, and uh, playing a lot of like little mini tour events and playing tournaments or just playing with people, you start networking and. I believe the more you play, the more opportunity you give yourself, the, the quicker you will be able to realize the goal for you, that you set for yourself. Yeah. And uh, I think managing expectations is a, is a really big uh, thing that I have had to learn um, through playing a competitive sport like golf. You can't go out there thinking, okay, I feel like I'm at 64. i gotta, I got to have that number in my head. No, you, you got to just think, all right, fairway, green, let's make a putt. Think about the task at hand. I think that's... That's a really big thing that competitive golfers struggle with. And from what I've learned, being around guys who have won multiple events on the mini tours and events out there on, on uh, web.com and Challenge Tour and Alps Tour, um, the, the one thing that people struggle with to get to that next level is, you know, how do I manage my expectations for one? And secondly is, how do I block out all the noise? How do I not see that hazard in front of me? How do I, how do I just think like this? You know, my perception's reality. If I, if I just see the ball going straight, like I can do on a wide open driving range, why can't I just hit that straight ball when the fairway's narrow and I've hazard on the left and right? So it's it's a, it's a huge mental game, and I think that this, that's a big hurdle that's, that's set, that can separate a lot of uh, amateurs from pros. I think Tom Watson said it said it best in a uh, in an interview back in the day when he was you know winning a lot of major events and. You can interview or ask them, you know, like what's what separates a uh, amateur from a pro. And if you said something on that on those same lines, it's in the fact like, okay, do you, do you see that that hole out there in the middle of the driving range? Like, yeah. Like, well, that looks like an easy, easy shot, right? And the guy's like, yeah. He's like, okay. Well, what if you put you know the Atlantic Ocean on the left side and, and trees on the right, and you have uh, a, a huge pot bunker in front of that par three hole? Now, is that a hard hole or is that a He's the only thing. Well, it's a hard hole. He's like, well, there it is. That's what separates you from me. He doesn't see that. Good golfers don't see trouble. I mean, competitive, really good tour pros don't see trouble. They they know the shot. That's why you know, track management is so good. You can see the straight shots. You know, you know your your mechanics. You know how open or closed the faces that impact. You know how to control it now. So it's true. It's that's, incredible. That's, yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy how, how much of a mental game it is. But yeah. I love it. I, I love that. Yeah, so I guess completely switching topics here, your other big passion is cooking. And as I mentioned, you were on MasterChef. I guess yep. what like experience did you have in cooking before going on that? And like, how would you have considered, like, rated yourself as a chef before going on the show? Man, so, I mean, I've cooked in and out of different kitchens just uh, from from college. I think one of my first cooking jobs was at Florida State University, where I went to school, Go Knowles. Um, I went to school there, and I worked at one of the dining halls, um, just outside of one of the dorms that I, I lived at in freshman year. It was a fun gig. I loved food. I got to eat for free, <laughs> and I got to cook whatever I wanted. So I loved the pasta station. That was my, that was my favorite line. I could come up with any sauces. Any ingredients I want to put in there, they, they let me have free reign. And we, we worked boiler, we worked uh, the rotisserie chicken uh, line, we did salad, we did everything. So I learned a little bit of everything there, but when I went to Florida State, I did a study abroad in, in Paris, and I was blessed enough to be able to take, take that on, and we had uh, about three days a week where we had no classes. So I decided to learn how to cook at one of the local restaurants. They just let me in the back there and worked on the table for cash and learned, learned a lot of French. Uh, probably a lot of French curse words there because uh, the chef was yelling at everybody. And okay. it, was, it was great. I learned language and I learned food. So I got to learn a lot of the basics there. Uh, learned, took some certificate classes at the Cordon Bleu in Paris. So I really got a good basis of how to cook, uh, how to cook food properly in the, in the French fashion. After that, um, came back to college. After college, worked a little bit here in the kitchens, and I loved being in the front of the house and serving. So I did that to help fund uh, a lot of my golf, and uh, I just always had a passion with food. Um, so getting on MasterChef, uh, MasterChef, it was, it was during like a low point in, in my golf career where I actually injured myself 
uh, at a restaurant, a wine glass went through my left arm, my forearm, severed my ulnar nerve, uh, cut a tendon, and I was out of golf for about eight months. Uh, during that time, I was I think I was at a plus three handicap. My parents were coming up the, the day before to come watch me play a big tournament in Orlando, and that night, I, I ended up having that accident. So instead of coming up to watch me in a tournament, they came up to see me at the hospital when I was about to go to surgery to get it all fixed up. So after that, I was thinking to myself, like, what am I going to do? I, I love cooking. I, after some, some therapy and rehab on my arm, um, I was able to get back into cooking a little bit. And um, one of the casting directors came into the restaurant I was working at in Orlando, and we talked, and uh, they invited me to come out to, to audition for MasterChef. And you know, four months later, after multiple video submissions and uh, on-camera interviews and all this, I, I was in the, I, I was sure. And it was an amazing experience. It was like, like think of summer camp that, that, that you were at and you were a part of, but it, it was for foodies. Like people that were so into food that they, like that was their passion. You know, if they weren't working their other jobs, they were, they could have been chefs. And that's, that's what it was like. It was just cool being surrounded by all that energy, a lot of positive energy from people that just love food as much as I did. And, yeah, uh, honestly, man, like not, not to sound too, uh, <laughs> too like cocky, but, after after winning one of those first challenges from from like a meatloaf challenge, I really felt I really felt like I could have been like a real top contender in there. I, I felt like I had some really good skills, but uh, it just wasn't my time to win. So, um, but I had a great experience. Yeah, um, I thought so really too. Yeah. Did you know while it was recording that you'd be one of like the fan favorites on the show? Because I noticed. You were definitely one of the focuses of one of the main characters being shown. You know, I did not know that. No, um, it, it's it's funny. You know, when you when you do a show like that, where there's like fifteen to twenty cameras on you at all, at all all points in that in that studio, um, you have no idea what kind of story that they're they're building up. All you know is that you have to cook like the most perfect medium rare steak. Or you have to come up with some crazy dish from this mystery box, and that's the only thing you're focusing on is like don't like don't burn the scallops and and don't mess up the cake. That's pretty much what you're focusing on. You're focusing on trying to get get that get that stuff done. And I had no idea until after watching the show that I would have you know I was, I was kind of like looked at as as one of the like real top standouts. But you know exactly um, yeah the show and, and they, they built it up and and I I, I guess I ended up falling down and that's that's how that's how it was but yeah if you screwed up yeah. making said uh medium rare steak i guess you get it from gordon ramsay was he actually is he actually that mean in real life or is it just <laughs> i think partially a show you know it's 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 a it's a show for sure there's there's some drama that has to be that has to be uh, looked at uh gordon ramsay is a great guy um joe bastianis and graham elliott the other two judges were amazing as well Really cool, really helpful people. Uh, Gordon Ramsay is a really, really fun person to be around. And when he mess up, it's like it's like a he know uh, he knows he wouldn't normally mess up something up like this, or he he knows that it's it's something that just has to be called out. Uh, after being an executive chef like him and working on the line and, and you know watching Hell's Kitchen, obviously you can see how how he can be frustrated over you know how how something could be so simple as like maybe seeing a scout could could be overcooked, and he has to call you out on that. So when he called my my mac and cheese, and I don't know if I can I can say this or not, mac and shit um, on live TV, I thought that was pretty hilarious. But uh, good thing that was one of the only things that he didn't like from my cooking. And if you do Google me um, on MasterChef with my name, first and last name, then, then at least it does show one of the highlights that I that I had. That I'm really proud of. Yeah, uh, no, for sure. Getting chewed out by Gordon Ramsay though is like a bucket list thing. So. Yeah, for sure. And you have to have that happen at least once in your life, right? Yeah, so exactly. That was definitely that was blessed to be able to, to experience that in the middle of a desert while prepping for 500 U.S. soldiers on their way to Afghanistan, and you only have, like, less than two hours of prep. So, I mean, they're building it up for a, for a huge dramatic uh, situation that happened, and, and they, they got what they wanted. No, exactly. So... Uh, my girlfriend actually wants me to ask you if you still watch the show, and if so, who your favorite cast member is. Cause me and her watch, and we yeah, have a clear favorite. Tough. I, you know, I was watching the seasons after me, and uh, I haven't been watching this season as much. I, I watched like the first couple episodes. Um, 
I haven't, I haven't, I don't, I can't say that I can pinpoint one favorite because I, I wouldn't be able to, to, to really, to really know if that is my favorite or give anybody that much credit um, yet because I just haven't watched the show that, I uh, haven't followed it that often. Fair, fair. The correct answer was Bimbo, by the way. I don't know if you know. Oh, okay. But, but, <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to so, watch now. We'll watch after. Yeah, exactly. Last, is there anything you learned from MasterChef that you think you could use to help you reach the next level in golf? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's funny because I felt like I could I could kill a, ma- a mystery box challenge with Gordon Ramsay, you know, breathing heavily down the back of my neck a lot easier. I could I could win that and, and feel more at ease than making a you know, an eight foot putt to to win a big tournament. I don't know what it is. It's so for a longest time I was I was trying to like I was trying to deal with that, that fact. Like why why does it feel why does it feel easier why does it feel easier to me to, to cook something under pressure, under time pressure than it is to just make a freaking putt and I kind of learn how to how to how to meld those two together so I was talking with the coach and the coach was like well why don't you think about you know birding a par five as like a recipe so the first ingredient is to hit the fairway you know once you get that done oh. then your second ingredient is to hit the green now don't think too much about how perfectly you're chopping up that onion per se don't think about how perfectly you have to hit this ball just hit the ball because you already know how to do it so I was trying to quickly put myself back into the, the to the Master Chef kitchen when, when I when I play around the golf and try to make it more natural for me because I can I used to love just opening up my fridge in college and coming up with random random dishes from whatever I had in the fridge and I would I would I would make a make a mean a mean dish late at night if I had to. Which I wish the natural for me to do. I wish I'm living alone in Toronto. I'm gonna to start taking pictures of my fridge and sending it to him. Like, what do I make? All I know is hey, you know what? Dude, that's not a bad idea. I've been thinking about really getting into YouTube and starting up a channel. And I don't know, like, if your listeners would would be able to give me some advice on that or, or just hear what they'd like to say. But I, I I'm thinking about doing something like that where someone just like <laughs> texts me three ingredients and I'll go out that night and go buy them and come up with a crazy dish and post it on Instagram or YouTube the next day or something like that. Sure, I actually really like that. that idea. Right? Sure. Like, uh, we can, I'll we, get we, we can start with you. If, if, shoot, me a, shoot me a picture of what you want me to cook with. Just give me three ingredients and I'll come up with a dish. It's like a mystery fridge challenge or something, you know? Okay, I'll I love come it. come up with a dish and I'll, and I'll like time lapse a little recipe video I, I i need some i need some kind of like push like that to, to be able to like come up with some stuff from the creative that was good i like that i love it we'll get it going so okay then, cool uh my final question for you which i think i know the answer to but if if you could be a pro golfer on the pga tour or a world famous chef which would you choose i'm i'm, I'm gonna be that guy and say i want to be both oh I, wow I, <laughs> I, I would love to, to be on the tour for as long as I can. Five years would be awesome. You know, if I could win one tournament, then I get, you know, get some exemptions for the, for the years to come. That'd be sweet. But, you know, you gotta, you got to think of business ideas. you got to think of other things you're, you're passionate about. And I would love to, you know, either open up a franchise or get behind a really good food-centric business idea and, and try to take over the world. Because I don't... I don't necessarily see myself as only a professional golfer or as only a chef. As as you might know now from 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 speaking with me, like I, I I've done. I mean, I can't say I've been on the PGA Tour, obviously, but I've I've played professional world ranking events. I've been on Master Chef. I have a lot of these other things that still want to get out of me. I, I feel like I want to do it all, and. I won't really feel complete until I do it. So if I can get there on tour, that'd be great. And then right from there, let's go into a food business. And that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking at doing. I love you know it. That's a great answer. In Toronto? There's, this, there's this one restaurant in Toronto someone told me to go to, and I, I really enjoyed it. I think it was, man, it was this cool little spot. And and it had, like, hip-hop, old hip-hop music. And it was a small bar. And the chef had just these, like, like little bites 
and this one guy was like cutting up pork belly on the side, and I had these like amazing little lettuce tacos. I'm trying to think of this name. Oh, when I think of the name of the restaurant, I'm gonna I'm gonna hit you up on it, and you'll probably you'll probably know it. No, I have to I go. Like I, I'm only just moved. I just moved there this week from Montreal. Oh, so. oh, really? Yeah. Okay. I'll have to okay. go find it now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, uh, as soon as I find out, I'll, I'll, I'll text you. It was, it was amazing, and it was, I, I love that atmosphere. Just like old school hip hop. Some chefs just cutting up some tacos for you fresh, and you have like really good like classic cocktails. And I like that. I like that style. That's that's what I would I would do. I like to be in the front, you know. Mixing up the music, maybe making your pork belly sliders, and then my buddy's making me cocktails. I feel like that would be that'd be fun for me to do. Exactly. So before I let you go, yeah, exactly. Before I let you go, I want to give you a chance to tell our audience anything you'd like to share. If you have anything extra, and for sure, I'll get them get some good feedback on. Hopefully, you start a YouTube or Instagram account. I think that's a great idea, but go for it yeah yeah sure so i mean um you know I, first of all thank you for having me on i hope we can do this again in the future and 100 kind of catch up and, and see uh see where everything's been going and, and all that and uh yeah i uh my instagram is francis uh b letter b golfin g-o-l-f-i-n i might be changing it soon so follow me on that um and I will be on Home Shopping Network in November as I'll be the brand representative for KitchenAid Appliances. I'll be showing off their mixers. Um, so keeping my hand in the, in the, in the food passion pot there. Um, so I'm really excited to be creating some content for KitchenAid, um, showing off some awesome recipes using their mixer. That's going to be kicking off in November and hopefully a lot into the new year. So with that being said, I'm going to really look into starting up a, a YouTube channel where I can show off all these recipes and people can kind of collaborate with me and, and shoot me some ideas of recipes they want to see me make and maybe even do that whole uh, mystery fridge challenge too. I think that would be a lot of fun. So right now, they could follow me. Y'all can follow me on Francis B. Golfin. Um, shoot me a message. Give me a follow. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to get this thing started. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Francis, and we'll stay in touch. And like you said, we'll for sure have you on again soon. Sounds good. Thanks again, Zach.